I don't really uh, hardly even remember. But it was in the summer between my second and third year in high school that somebody came up to me on a street corner and talked to me about Jesus Christ. And uh, it was the first time, you know, I'd never had anybody talk to me about having a personal experience with Christ or talk to me about the idea of the lordship of Christ, Jesus really being the master and lord of your life and giving everything to him, putting it on. I never had anybody ever talk to me about anything like that. And uh, during that summer, I committed my life to the Lord. And in the next two years was the most amazing miracle that you could ever believe because we had a revival in my high school. And I'm going to tell you about that revival that took place in my high school, how the Lord did it and how the whole thing. I'm going to tell you about that uh, tomorrow when I, I share with you. I'm going to share with you tomorrow evening. But it was just this, this incredible revival that, uh, that took place. Uh, you wouldn't believe it could happen through the lives of high school students ministering to other high school students, but all kinds of people started getting saved. Many people ended up here coming here to Elam. It was just really a, really a, a powerful time. Now, you are not ordinary uh, teenagers. Uh, you're here at an event called a leadership training camp. I mean, you'd have to be nuts. What would be, you know, what would get you to come to something called a leadership? There's something inside of you that's different from other people. There's something inside of you that you feel like you want to have an influence and you want to have an impact on others. And that's uh, that's a really that's a different quality. You know it's different because you know uh, in your your experience at school and with other people and things like that that there's something different happening inside of you. And so I'm really glad to have you here because that difference that was happening inside of you was happening inside of me also. When I was a high school student, I know the feeling, I know the that sense of destiny that you have and yet not knowing what the next step is or what to do or how to move forward in any kind of a way. Now I'm gonna talk with you this session, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the nature of uh, leadership and we're gonna talk also about the idea of leading other leaders because if you're gonna make a really powerful impact, whether it be in your church youth group or whether it be in your high school or whatever your situation, if you're gonna make a really powerful impact, you have to know how to build uh, coalitions. You have to know how to, how to lead other leaders, not just you kind of be a leader, but how to lead other leaders and make things happen. So we're gonna talk about that. Now, if you're like uh, me, when you hear the idea of the word leader, uh, it can feel, you can feel a little conflicted and feel conflicted about being the leader. Like, is, it even, is this even a good thing to be a leader? You know, uh, Sometimes even some of the things Jesus says makes you wonder whether it's a good thing to be a leader. And, uh, uh, but I want us to look at, uh, in that notes I passed out to you, a little passage here, actually two little passages, that talk about this idea of, um, of leadership. And uh, let's, look, let's look at there. Verse 24, it says here, Matthew chapter 20, verse 24, it says, And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself. Now, what had happened just before this is uh, two of Jesus' disciples, two brothers, James and John, they had come to Jesus and said, uh, Hey, look, we kind of would like to be uh, like like in key positions here, we'd like to sit on your right and left hand in the kingdom that's to come. When the other people heard about this, the other disciples, they were like envious and jealous and angry. So that's where we're at. So Jesus calls them to himself and he says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Now, he says the rulers of the Gentiles, the Gentiles are like the, you know, the non-believers, right? The, all the people who are not Jews, right? They're the Gentiles. And he says, now you know about the rulers of the Gentiles. What is he, what he, he's, he's trying to get at something. He's describing a certain kind of leadership. He says, they lord it over them, and their men exercise great or exercise authority over them. He says, that's how they do it. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Now, when I read this, it's a little disturbing to me because I think to myself, it seems like Jesus is kind of saying that leadership is not really a good thing, that being in a place of influencing others and being the head and not the tail and being in, a, uh, in that kind of a place, it's not necessarily a good thing. But that's not what he's trying to get at, and I'm going to explain that to you. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, 
And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And then in another kind of parallel passage to this uh, in Luke, he says this. It's, where it, it's kind of a passage where he's telling the same thing, but he says it in a little bit different way. Verse 26, he says this. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the servant. Okay, let's begin. Let's start out. This isn't in your notes. You might want to jot it down on a little side corner or something like that so you can, you can uh, follow along here. But let's start out talking about the nature of leadership. This is a little diagram I, I use that helps me to kind of explain the nature of leadership in this way. Okay, what is leadership, right? We throw this word around. We, we, you know, you want to be a leader. Well, what does that mean to be a leader? What is, it, what, what, what is that? And this is the nature of leadership, okay? I mean, this is what leadership is. A leader, okay, right up here, a leader influences, I'm just putting the first letter, you can write the words in if you want. The leader influences people, okay, to accomplish a purpose. This is what a leader does. A leader influences people to accomplish a purpose. So a leader is an influencer. Okay, right here. A leader influences other people to accomplish a purpose. Now, if the leader, let, let, let's say, for example, we were talking about um, I've been given the responsibility to dig a hole. Okay? Dig a, dig a hole. And, uh, and so here, here I am. I, I've been given this responsibility. Now, if I say, okay, it's my job to dig a hole. You know, it's my responsibility to dig a hole. No problem. I'm going to go dig the hole. I'm going to just jump in and dig the hole, right? Then I'm not a leader anymore. I'm a doer. See? That means a leader influences other people to accomplish a purpose. A doer just does the purpose. They just go do it. You know, so what, what do we got to do? We got to dig a hole? Okay, give me a shovel. I'm going. You know, I'm, I'm, I, you know I want to do it. I'll, I'll go do that. But a leader is a different thing altogether because when they come to me and they say, this purpose, what is it? This hole has got to be dug. I'm thinking to myself, okay, how do we get this hole dug? And so I think to myself, okay, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to recruit some people. I'm going to recruit like five people to, to help dig this hole, right? So I'm going to recruit some people. And then, and then I'm going to have to make sure that we have a schedule where all five of us show up at the same time. So I'm going to I'm going to schedule something there, right? So so we're we're all there to get the job done to make this thing happen. And then and then I want to make sure everybody's got the equipment that they need, right? So that they can do it. So I, I'm going to resource them, right? So I'm going to make sure they've got the resources that they need to to pull this thing off and that they've got the inspiration, right? That they're excited about the idea of of, of doing it. So they've got the inspiration to, to, uh, to make this thing happen and to get this hole dug. And so, so that's what I do. So I contact five people. I share the vision of why we need to have the hole dug. I set up a schedule with them. I set up resources, make sure we've got water there while they're digging, make sure we have shovels there while they're digging, put all this kind of thing together. And so they sign on with me. So now I've influenced them to accomplish the purpose of digging the hole. And so now they all show up, we dig the hole, we make something happen, we all do. See, that's what a leader is. Now, you might think to yourself, well, shouldn't you be a good example by getting out there and and digging the hole, you know, kind of a thing? Well, yeah, I'm not afraid to get in there with them when they're digging the hole and, and, and help them. But that's not what a leader is. A leader is not a person who digs holes. A leader is a person who influences other people to accomplish the purpose that needs to take place. So I, 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 it's not, it's not, whatever the purpose is, whether it's digging holes or whether it's setting up a leadership camp like this or whether it's what, whatever it is, it's something you're doing, setting up a Bible study on your high school campus or, or uh, putting together some kind of event at the church, a leader doesn't just jump in and do it, right? You know, we, we, we want to promote that we're going to have a, a Bible study on, a, on our campus. How are we going to do that, you know? Well, you say, okay, well, I'll 
print up uh, I'll print up the little pieces of paper and then I'll go around the high school and 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 tack them up and and then I'll be at the place where I tell everybody to come with my Bible and and I'll be there to to talk with them and, and you know that's all doing that's all doing see leading is different leading would mean okay we need to get advertisement who can I get that would be that would work on advertisement maybe have some ability in that area or something like that uh, you know and so I go to them and I share the dream what I'm trying to accomplish and I, I communicate with them and so they join in with me and and then I, I go okay uh, the Bible study who could I get maybe that would be willing to teach the Bible study and help out there and then who could I get that would do and so what happens a leader influences other people to accomplish the purpose okay what do you think about that what I just taught you right there what do you think of that idea Oh, God, help me. Does that make sense to you? Does it, uh, uh, you know, maybe you've, you've been like, a, you're like a really competent person, and so maybe you wanted to influence things and make things happen, and but rather than being a leader, you've been a doer. You know, you just got out there and just did things and tried to make things happen and haven't realized the importance of, getting people together, you know, to, to go after something, to go, go after. A leader influences people to, ac- to accomplish a purpose. And so what I'm going to focus on, though, in our talk today, this is like a general concept of leadership, but what I'm going to focus on in our talk today is this word influence. How do I influence other people to do things, right? There's other things we have to do. We have to resource them, and we have to recruit them, and we have to do these other things, inspire them, and so on. But how do I influence people? If I want to get people to come with me to do something, to get something accomplished, how do I influence them to make that kind of thing uh, happen? So Jesus tells us here, he tells us, he says, there's certain ways that are okay to influence people, but certain ways that are not. And we're going to talk about that. Now, um... In your, in your notes, it has a line that says, authority is the right to influence based on my position. And, uh, and Jesus basically destroys that whole view of leadership. You know, he says, we don't do leadership like the Gentiles do. We don't say, we don't, we don't look at people and say, I'm the king. That's why you're doing what I told you to do. I'm, in, I'm the general. I'm the captain. I'm the boss. That's why. You know what? I'm the father. That's why you do what I want you to do, right? I'm the mother. That's why you do what I want you to do, right? He says, he says, no, that's not the highest level of leadership. He says there's a higher level level of leadership than that. And so he just de- he destroys positional authority. Jesus tells us we should lead. This is a, a, the blank in your note. Jesus tells us we should lead. That's the word lead, like we have no position at all. He says we, we should lead as if we have no positional authority. We don't lead like the Gentiles. We don't lord it over people. We don't say, you should do it because the teacher left me in charge. That's why you should do it, see? That's, that's, that's relying on your position. It's relying on your, uh, the, that, that, that place that you have. He says that's not the right way to do it. He sa- in your notes it says this, authority is the right to influence based on my position, but power is my ability to influence apart from my authority. You know, uh, when I was raising my, uh, my children, you know, there are two, you know, I could just say, and, and of course, when people are young and immature, you have to use more, uh, I wouldn't just call it positional authority, but more direct command, you know, basically. You know, you don't run in the road. Why? Just don't say why. Just don't go in the road, right, because you're going to get squished. And, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to teach little kids, you know, in, in that. But as your children age, as people age, we move to another kind of teaching of our children, which is not just you do it because I told you to do it, but we, 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 we come to a place where we start, we start to persuade them. We start to talk with them, see? And, and power is my ability to influence apart from my authority. If my whole relationship 
in my leadership, whether it's my leadership in the family or my leadership in a husband and wife relationship or my leadership in my business or my leadership in my class government or whatever it is, if my whole basis for my leadership is because I'm the president, that's why you do it, you know, I have very low, I have a very, very low level of leadership. Now, there are basically 10 ways that a person exercises influence. How do we influence other people? There are 10 ways that a person exercises influence in the life of another. I'm going to talk to you about each of them just for a second. Three of them, Jesus says, don't use. And the other seven are available to us to use to influence people. So let's, let's talk about them. In your notes, uh, it might be on the... There, it says uh, ways to influence rooted in authority. Jesus says don't use these ways. These are not, these are not the best ways to influence uh, uh, people. So he says, don't, what, what, what shouldn't you do? Don't use position. You're doing it because I'm the boss. Don't use rewards. Right? That's, you know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm paying you. you know. Do it or I'll, I'll increase your pay. You know. That's how I'm going to get you to do it. You know, do, do your chores and I'll give you money. Right? Uh, or punishment. He says, he says these three different areas, these three areas are the, they're the lowest really level of leadership. When you're trying to influence somebody and get somebody to do something, if the only way you can get them to do it is by, by trying to pay them or by trying to, um, uh, you, you know, use your position in some way or by trying to punish them. Th these are the lowest levels of leadership. But then we have seven other tools that we have on how you can persuade somebody to do something, basically. How you can get other people to, um, to join with you in something. And I want to talk through each one of these. Okay, ways to influence without relying on authority. Okay, let's look at it there. Okay, first way you can influence without relying on authority is vision. That is a worthy cause. Okay, having a worthy cause. That's the, the, um, the, way, the way you can do it. So the vision or the cause, the worthy cause, that's a, that's a powerful tool to get people to um, to do something to 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 get on board. Now, what is vision? Vision is seeing the way things ought to be. How how you know how should it be? And uh, and so it's it you you get a picture in your mind. Uh, who 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 has something maybe that they're wanting to see happen in their high school or they're wanting to see happening in their church or youth group or just just. Something along that line. Just some, something in your mind that you think, you know, if my, if my high school were the way Jesus wanted it to be, if my church youth group were the way Jesus wanted it to be, um, uh, it would be more like this. Who has something like that that they could just share with me? Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, share it with me. What is it you'd like to see? Is it your youth group or your high school or what? Good. Okay. So, so uh, you're trying to, let's say, bring Christ into your high school. Okay. So that. Okay. So she. So she sits and she's thinking and she's saying to herself, she's saying, if you, you, you know, you've all prayed that prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right. You've prayed that prayer. Okay. That's that's where we get our vision from. If His kingdom comes and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven, what would your high school look like? If your high school was, thy, this is the prayer you prayed, remember? Thy kingdom come in my high school. Thy will be done in my high school. Right? It, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. I, I wish that it was in my high school right now as it is in heaven. Right? What would it be? So that's what's in her heart right now. She said, man, I'd love to see more people in my high school come to Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, you know, if we had more people in our high school come to Jesus Christ, imagine the joy of the Lord, you know. Imagine what it would be like if we, if we had a, a um, uh, you know, if we had like a regular kind of prayer meeting or Bible study going 
in our high school? And, and, and what if there weren't just like a few? What if there were like 20 or 30 or 50 or 60 or 100? What, what, what if all kinds of high school students were joining together and wasn't led by people outside and it wasn't led by other uh, uh, adults? Or like, it was just the students themselves all fired up about Jesus Christ and in the word of God and, and all excited. And man, what, what if it was so cool that we rented the auditorium at our, at our high school, and we, we had a chance to preach to the whole high school about Jesus Christ. I mean, wouldn't that be so awesome? See, what, see, what I'm doing right now is I'm, I am envisioning. So this is what a vision is. A lot of times you, think, you hear the word vision, it's like you think something, something's going to happen to you, you know, and you're, you know, and you I see it, I see it. It's not like that. You know, that's not what, that's, that's not what visioning is, okay? What a vision is, is when you let your mind follow the path, and, and it's it's like it, it's like you let your mind follow the path. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What would my high school be like if that was? You know, wouldn't it be cool? You know, students were walking. You know, people were reading. And what about that particularly maybe rough kid in the school that you think to yourself, man, he just comes from such difficult situation and he's you know he's such a bully and he's this and that and wouldn't it be great and, or maybe the the kind of depressed kid that's in school that you look at and you think man that guy is just like he's like so cynical and so empty and so depressed wouldn't it be tremendous if he was just saved and filled with the spirit of god and filled with purpose and direction wouldn't it be so powerful see see all i'm doing right now is i'm envisioning as i do that what are you feeling as i'm talking like that what, what did you have She's get feeling excited. Are you feeling excited? Okay. You, you know what? What, do you, what happens? You feel, uh, when you hear those that, that 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 vision, something inside of you goes, yes, yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, that's what's supposed to be happening. You know, that's what's supposed to be going. Well, that same thing that's happening inside of you right now when I'm talking like that is the same thing that happens to the other people that you're trying to recruit to get involved with you. And so as the leader, one of the greatest responsibilities you have the, as the leader is to get a picture in your mind of what the future is supposed to be like if God were having his way. If it, what, is the, what, it, what would it be like, you know? And you get that picture in your mind, and then you share that picture with other people. And so maybe I talk about these things that I just talked about right now, and then I, I say to her, you know, she's responding, right? She's, like, getting excited. And, and you can see that in people. You know, you'll talk to some people, and they're like, mm, 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 mm. you know, they're not going anywhere, you know. But you'll talk to some people, and all at once there's, like, the spark that happens inside of them. And so I might look at her and say, would you help me do this? This is so exciting. Would you help me? We could do this together. We could do this if we could. You know, the whole modern missions movement was started because a group of college students in the 1800s, they were out goofing around together, and it started raining. And on their way, their way back to school, they, they, they ran underneath the edge of this, uh, it was like a, a haystack. It's, in fact, it's called the Haystack Revival. They ran underneath the edge of this haystack. There were, I think there were like six of them, six or eight of them. And they just got under there, and they started talking to each other about what would it be like if the gospel went out to the whole world? What would it be like if these nations that, that had no message of Christ at all, if they were able to, uh, to, to experience Christ and to see Christ and to be filled with the Spirit and the Lord was able to move in powerful ways? And as they began talking about it in, that, in this haystack, it's called the Haystack Revival. It's a historical event that took place. As they talk about it in this, this, uh, the, this time, all at once one of them says, that one of them looks at the other and says, we could do this. We could do this if we will. We could do this. And, and this group of students, they just, they just say, you know, here they're in college and they're being prepared to be business people and to do all these different kinds of things. And they just go, they just go, you know what? We're just forgetting all that, and we're going to go to the nations of the world. And over the next several years, they started traveling out to different parts of the world. And, and it was just so, it was so powerful. God began to, and out of that became what they call the modern missions movement, where people now travel all over the world carrying the message of the gospel, all that kind of stuff. All because of a group of students 
got together and they said, we could do this if we will. It's so powerful. And vision is like that. Vision has that, that element to it that when, when, someone, when you hear somebody who is sincere about something and really wants to see something powerful and see something, see something happen, there's something inside of you that just, it's very difficult to resist. And you're able to influence the other people. If, if you have that vision inside of you, the vision, the, you know, the worthy cause. What's the worthy cause? What's the thing that the Lord's putting in your heart that he wants to do? You know, uh, it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be, you know, not everybody is going to do the same kind of thing. But when God puts that kind of thing inside of you and you share that with other people, not everybody will, re- will respond, but some people you'll, you'll see they just have this, they're just something inside of them that says, yes. And you'll look at them and you'll say, we could do this if we will. And they'll go, yes, we could do it. What do we have to do? What do we have to see? That vision. So what happens then? When that happens, when you share the, the inspiration, the vision, right? The leader influences people. That's one of the ways we influence people. Okay. Another way to influence people is likability. Likability. That is... If you're a person people like, right? You know, some people just have that kind of personality that people like, right? And people like to be around you, you know? And if you say to them, hey, let's go do this, you go, okay, let's go do it. You know, they don't even know why they want to do it. They just want to do it with you. You know, they just like you. Okay? So let's go do this. So likability, that's another tool that we have to to move people forward. Another thing we have is relationship, trust, and history. Relationship, trust, and history. So, you know, for example, my, uh, the guy who spoke to you yesterday, uh, Joe Jansen. Joe Jansen was actually a student. When I started the basic college ministry, he was a student at Oswego State College. And uh, that's where I started the ministry. And uh, he got involved, you know, and he started coming to the Bible studies. And, and he started coming to our events and retreats and different things that we were doing and stuff like that. And, and so from the time he has been... He was in college. I've been a, uh, you know, had a relationship with him basically till now, right? And, and so when I talk to Joe, I can influence him because I have trust and I have history with him, see? And there are people you have trust and history with. There are people that have been around you. They've seen who you are and what you do for, for a long time. You know, they've been, maybe they've been in, since you were in sixth grade, you know, they've been around, you know? And you've, you've got, you got, you, you got connections with them, you know, in that kind of way. You have trust in history. So when you talk to them and you say, look, this is something I think needs to happen. So there's something in them that says, yeah, I want to do that with you. Uh, another way that you can influence a person is through coaching or personal investment. And th- that is, um, you know, maybe you've helped somebody, you know, in some kind of way. Somebody's had trouble in life or difficulties or things like that, and you've expressed an interest in them, and you've helped them, you've coached them in different ways. This church right now, actually, I started this church, and, and uh, we built this building and all this kind of stuff, but the guy who is pastor of this church, this church now, his name is uh, Josh Finley, Pastor Josh Finley, and Pastor Josh is, uh, you know, he's a person who I have influence in his life. Why? Because I coached him, and he worked with me in the church for several years, and working in the youth area, and I opened the way for him to become the pastor of the church. So I have, I have uh, through personal investment, I've, I can influence him in that kind of way. Another way we uh, influence people is through persuasion, right? Persuasion. Oh, come on, you've done it, you know. Come on, come with us. Yes, you know, this will be awesome. Let's do it. Come on, you know. Well, you know, hey, let's do it. And then you start telling people reasons why it's a good idea. You, you know, come on, let's do it, let's do it. Now, you may think to yourself, persuasion, is that good or bad? Well, you, you know, there's a, there's a difference between persuasion and manipulation, right? Are we talking about manipulating people to get them to do what we want? No. The way you tell the difference between persuasion and manipulation is, persuasion is for their benefit manipulation is for your benefit see so if i talk to somebody and i say and i say oh come on do this do that but i'm really the reason i want them to do it is because it's for me that's manipulating i'm trying to manipulate the person to get something for myself 
persuasion looks exactly like manipulation. Really, it looks ex the same, except the difference is my motivation, the thing that's in my heart is I want that person to, uh, to grow and be better and, and, and to move forward in that kind of way. Okay, another way we can influence people is through expertise. If I'm really good at something, right? If I'm really good at, if I have some kind of talent, and, and uh, you know, now, because it's been all the years, it wasn't this way when I first started in high school. I'll tell you, you know, the story tomorrow about the revival and all that happened and stuff like that, my first big leadership experiences. It wasn't this way because, because of, um, uh, I wasn't an expert then, but now I've become more of an expert on leadership and leading things and getting things done, and making things happen. And so sometimes people will listen to what I have to say and will do what I tell them to do just because they look at the history and they'll go, wow, I saw you do this, 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 and you're telling me this is the right thing to do, I'm going to do it. Well, you know, I'm going to do it because you have an expertise that we have observed and, uh, and, and influenced in that way. And then uh, the, the last way that I have down in your notes is to be an example. To be an example. You know, that you're, you know, it was one of the interesting things that Paul says to young people. He says, be thou an example to the believer. And there's something so powerful when you are an example of what you talk about. That is that you, you know, people look at you and they say, hey, that guy is consistent. That guy is solid. That guy, you know, he tells you he's an example. He does the right things. He's, he's right there. There's, there's something very powerful about that. And people want to follow you. And want, they're, in, they're more easily influenced by you when they can see that you're an example. You, 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 you live, live it. You live it, see? So leadership, leaders influence people to accomplish a purpose. Doers just do the purpose. Leaders influence. And what we're talking about, these are, these are different tools. See, so what I'm just giving you right now is very powerful because I've, I, I've given you the tool pack right now. So that you, if you're looking at a situation and you're saying, okay, how do I get this thing moving? These are the things that you can do. It says, in, in your notes it says, in my experience, uh, it is following Jesus' instructions to lead or influence without relying on authority is the key to leading leaders. And so I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about this idea of leading leaders. Leaders don't, uh, don't follow you because you have positional authority. This is the thing. Leaders are the hardest people to lead, right? Leading other leaders. Because if I'm already a leader, what do I need you for? You know, I'm not, I'm, you know if, I'm a, if I'm a follower, then I'm following you because I don't know where I'm going. So, you know, I want to, but I already know where I'm going. I'm a leader. I know what I'm wanting to do. I know where I'm wanting to go. I'm knowing what, so, so how do you lead leaders? And uh, um, uh, the, the way you lead leaders is not by exercising uh, positional authority, uh, well, I, I should put it this way, positional authority is your last resort. You want to lead them uh, by, you, by influencing them and by sharing. Somebody says leading leaders is compared with herding cats. Can you imagine herding cats? Cats like leaders all have their own agenda. They don't need each other. They can each get their own food if necessary. They don't need you. They are self-starters and they don't need to be led. And so when you try to get cats to go somewhere, they're like, uh, hey, I, I don't need you. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I can do this myself. You know? Well, I won't feed you anymore. Big deal. Just let me outside. I'll take care of myself. I don't need what you have to offer. See, Cats don't, cat, cat, cats, and, and, and that's the way it is. Other leaders are like that. Trying to move them all in the same direction when they have little personal need to respond can be a real challenge. And this is what you've experienced, this, some of you that have actually tried to lead something where you've had stubborn people or people that weren't ready to come along with you. So this is what we're talking about. Jesus increases the challenge by insisting that we not use the, those means of leadership that are rooted in authority or position. So it's really important because the problem we have is this. The success of any organization is dependent on how top leaders inspire and lead others in their organization. It's how I lead other people in the organization. It determines whether or not the organization is going to accomplish something and be great. So, you know, if you think of it like this, there's what we call the value zone. 
The value zone is the place where the person actually uh, interacts with the thing that you're trying to accomplish. The, the people actually interact with what you're trying to accomplish. So, for example, let's talk about Walmart for a second. Probably all of you know, right, Walmart probably has some building someplace where all the Walmart chief executives and all the Walmart business people and all the people who create the Walmart uh, brand and decide what things are going to be in the store and all this kind of, they're all off someplace in some building, right? You know that, right? Someplace uh, uh, out there, right? But who's the most important person to you as the customer? <laughs> yeah, well, he says he says I'm the most important person. Well, okay, that's true. But when you're trying, when you're going into the Walmart, who's the most important person to you? Cashier. How, how about you're trying to find something? Who's the most important person to you? Huh? Who? The greeter? Maybe you're coming in. The greeter, right? Why? Because the greeter, the greeter, or the or the Walmart worker who's stocking shelves or something like this they are actually in what we call the value zone, right? They're actually in the value zone. What's that mean? It means that people, the people who experience Walmart, they're never gonna experience the president of Walmart, right? The CEO of Walmart. They're not gonna experience the chief executives of Walmart. They're not gonna experience any of that. Those people may be awesome people, but the people that, that are most important to them are the people that are in the value zone with them. For example, right now, uh, you've got some people that are here with you, uh, people like team leaders and different things like that, that are uh, students or graduates or this kind of thing related to Elam and stuff like that. But, and really, who's the most important person here to you, right? Right? Who's going to, you know, you, do you care about the vice president of Elam Bible Institute? He's not here. You know what I mean? We don't have one, but he's not here. Right, right. And if the fact is, if I wasn't speaking here today, you probably wouldn't care that much about me either, right? Who cares about the president? You know, what I care about is my team leader, because they're the ones that are going to help me, you know, through this or through that. Or they're the people who are in the value zone. So, here, here's the thing that happens: at Walmart, the leaders of Walmart could have the greatest plans in the universe, but if they cannot get that passed down to the person that's in the value zone, then you're not going to experience it. It doesn't matter what kind of things are happening in, in the headquarters of, of uh, Walmart in that kind of way, okay? And, and so the success of any organization is dependent on how the top leaders inspire and lead the other leaders in the organization. That's, you know, it, it's it, my ability to influence the department heads and the department's head's ability to influence their staff and their staff's ability to influence the student workers and all that stuff is all passed down until ultimately there you are and who you're relating to. You're relating to a student worker or a, a graduate or whatever. You're, you're relating there. And if we haven't been able to pass down to those people our values, then you're in the value zone. You're, you're not going to you know, you're not going to get really what we were trying to accomplish even by this event that we're having unless those people have got it, unless they've experienced it and, and seen it. So it's very important that we learn how to influence other leaders and help them in that way. So here, here are three keys to leading leaders, okay? Three keys to leading leaders in your notes. Number one, to lead leaders, you must be trustworthy. You must be trustworthy. You got to have two two things go into this word credibility, right? If it, when you think about is this person credible? Two things that go into it. First is their integrity and their competence. Those are the two ingredients that create integrity. So, for example, would you want to follow somebody who you thought was a sneak of some kind? You didn't trust them. Would you want to follow that person? Would you? No, you wouldn't want to follow that person. Okay. What if they were really good at what they do, but you knew they were a sneak? They had zero integrity. What's that? If he was a ninja. Even if he was a ninja, if you knew absolutely 
He was a sneak. That is, he had no integrity. You could have no guarantee of what he would or wouldn't do or what, how he might treat you or what would happen. Would you want to follow him? No, right? Okay, let me, let's tell you this. What, what if the guy is absolutely high integrity, beautiful guy or gal now we're talking about? They're high integrity, they're beautiful people, but they suck at what they do. Would you want to follow them? When they, come, they have all kinds of character. They pray. They read their Bible. They are holy. Okay? They are holy, but they stink at what you need to get done. Do you want to follow them? No. See? That's why you have to have both ingredients to be a leader. You have to be a person who is got that is trustworthy, that people you have high integrity, and you have to have some level of competence, right? Because if people are going to follow you, they gotta they want to know what what's your you know what's the basis for me following you? Do you know what the heck you're doing, right? So how do you get this? If you want to have this in your life, what do you do? Here's a few things I could say to you. First of all, you keep your promises. If you tell somebody you're going to do something, if you tell somebody you're going to be somewhere, if you tell them you're going to be there at a certain time, you say, I'll be there at 3 o'clock, I'll be there at such and such a time, you absolutely keep your promises. A person who doesn't keep their promises doesn't have integrity. Whether it's small or big, they don't have integrity, and people will pick up on that. If you're always late, if you're this or that, you've got to keep your promises. Next, you follow up. You follow up. If you say to a person, I will call you back, you call them back. You always make sure you call them back. You, if somebody writes you an email, you answer them, okay? Uh, if you make appointments, you show up. You follow up, okay, in that way. You follow through. That is, you, 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 um, you follow through on the thing. You call back if you're supposed to call back in that kind of way. You're, you're consistent. Be consistent. Follow the rules yourself. You know, on campus, for example, we made some, like in the, that parking area that's between, over where the student center is and stuff like that, we have a couple of guest parking spots in there, right? And they're like the closest to the door to get in and stuff like that. And so sometimes, you know, like, I don't do it often, but it's raining, and I want to get into the building quick, right? So I'll pull up there, and I pull into the guest spot. And my wife looks at me and goes, what are you doing? I said, it's raining out. I want to get into the building. She says, she says how are people going to follow you if you don't even follow the rule? You made the stupid rule. If you don't even follow the rule, how are they going to follow you? Well, I have to back out, you know, and pull into the other spot that doesn't say guest, right, in, in, in that kind of way. Okay, so, so, so what happens there? See, what she's doing, she's challenging me. Mike, be consistent. Be consistent. Don't, don't you know, cheat on what's happened. And then admit mistakes. You know, sometimes people think that if they admit their mistakes, it takes away from their credibility. The truth is, when you admit your mistakes, people are more, tr you're more trustworthy, see? Because I know the person that I'm following is going to make mistakes. Why do I know that? Because they're a human being. Everybody makes mistakes. I know they're going to make mistakes. But if they're hiding that they made a mistake, then I go to myself, I don't know if I can trust this person. They're pretending they're something that they're not. I don't know what's going to happen here. So when you make a mistake, just come clean. You know, hey, I made a mistake. You know, hey, well, we decided we would do that. That was the wrong thing to do. It didn't happen the way we thought it was going to happen. And, and, and when you admit your mistakes, then people go, I can trust this person. Why? Because they saw a mistake, they admitted it, and now they're recommitting and they're try, trying to do the right thing. So admit your mistakes. So, so this is, uh, so we have to be trustworthy. Okay, number two, to lead, your lead, to lead leaders, you must eliminate any competition. Now, um, when you, this thing of competition, this is a, this is a, big, uh, uh, a big deal here. Because um, if there's competition between you, and a lot of times leaders are into competition, they like competition. 
If there's any competition between you and the other person, you will never be able to lead them. The thing that enables you to lead them is when they realize that you're not fighting against them, but you're trying to pull with them in some kind of way. And so you have to be careful about competition. Now, I, as a leader, you know, I told you from high school, I became a leader. As a leader, I'm always, I've always, I always like competition. I like winning, right? I like fighting and winning and going after things and stuff like that. And I remember it created a problem for me with my, with my kids because, you know, my first two children are uh, boys. All three of them like to fight, but my first two children are, were boys. And when the boys were little, you know, they would want to wrestle with me. And so I didn't mind that, but I would always beat them, right? We would wrestle, and I would win, you know? And they would cry and run to their rooms and get mad, right? <laughs> you know? And, and, I, and I, I thought to myself, I thought, what's the problem here? You know, because I was a new father. I didn't really know what was going on. I go, what's the problem here? Why are they, you know, because I see other parents wrestle with their kids, and the kids, ha, 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 they're laughing. You know, they're laughing. And so, you know, my kids, they're all like, ah, and running in the other room, you know? So, I, so, I, so finally I went to an experienced father, and I said to him, I said, I said, you know, this whole wrestling thing, I wrestle with my kids, but they don't seem very happy. And he looked at me and he said, do you ever let them win? And I, that never had occurred to me, you know what I mean? <laughs> I should let them win, you know what I mean? What, what, what is, you know, if they want to take on the old man, they should, you know, <laughs> you know, down, you know, they should come wrestling, <laughs> down on you know. And, uh, and have you ever let them win? And I, I said, no, I didn't. I didn't think about that, see? And what I learned from that experience is people, if you're going to work with people, they got to win. You can't, you can't always be the winner in every interaction. If you, if you are always the winner in everything, then the people who are wor- with you and working with you, they don't feel comfortable, see? And so to lead leaders, you've got to eliminate a- any competition. So how do we eliminate competition? I've given you a few things here that will help you to eliminate competition. First of all, when you've, when you've got somebody that you're trying to recruit and pull them into something, value them by taking time to find out their gifts. So what does that mean? When I, you know, even as the, uh, you know, as the pastor of the church, I had to learn this, you know, as a, a pastor of the church. Here, uh, so I, I, I need to have the, uh, I need to have a greeter, right, at church, somebody who greets people when they come in, right? And so if I value the job more than I value the person, I just say, okay, okay, you, can you help me be the greeter? Oh, yeah, but sure, I'm willing. Okay, and I put you in there, and you're the greeter. Now, you're not gifted at being a greeter, you know. You're, you're not, uh, you're not, it's not your heart. It's not your anything. You, you just are standing there, and you, you're doing the thing. That's no good. See, that's not, people are not going to want to follow you. They'll do it for a little while, but then they quit. So what, you ha- what, what we do instead is you take the time to find out what is interesting to that person. What's, the, what's something that they like? What is, what's involved? And then what you want to try and do when you're recruiting the person is you value them by taking the time to find out their gifts. What are they interested in? Well, they really like writing. Or they really like doing this. Or they really like doing that. Okay, what are they interested in? And then you try and get them involved. You value them by taking time to find out their gifts. And then you value them by listening to their goals and aspirations, right? What are things that are important to them? One of the ways that, you know, if, I li- if, I, if you listen to people, you can begin to hear. Maybe they are really passionate about seeing people come to Christ. Or maybe they're really passionate about encouraging people. Or maybe they're really passionate about helping the poor. Or maybe they're really passionate about certain issues, you know, of uh, relationships and things like that. If you know what they're passionate about, then you can try and get them involved in the things that they're passionate about, and that shows that you value them. Another thing that we do is we respect other people. How do you respect them? One of the ways you respect them is by asking their advice. What do you think the right thing to do is? How would you go about handling this? And, uh, and unless they're crazy, you, you, you try and find out what, you know, what it is, and you try and follow, go along with their advice. You showcase their talent. That is, you know, if you find out that they're really good at, at uh, sharing their faith, then you give them a chance to share their faith. Or you find out they're really good at leading a Bible study, you give them a, find out they're really good at music, you showcase their talent. You give them a chance to do that. And you speak words of blessing over them. How do you respect a person? Man, you look at them and say, boy, I really see that in you. Man, I can see that quality. You know, you've got such and such. And, 
and you know, you've got this ability. And wow, I wish I could do that. You're so good at doing such and such. And you speak about not some empty flattery, but genuinely, because you value them, you respect them, you look at what their talent is, and you commend them for their talent. Next, you see, we empower them. Okay? How do you empower somebody? Uh, you know, you know I, I, I put down here, so I'm your partner, not your boss. I don't, I don't like people calling me. Even, you know, I'm the president of the school and stuff like that. I, I, I know who I am. I don't have to have people call me boss to, to, uh, to do what I have to do. As a matter of fact, I'd much rather have, especially the lead people who are close to me, I want them to have a feeling that they're a part of a team, that in, there's a team involvement that's happening. And, um, and so that, to me, that empowers them, says to them, hey, look, you have a voice here. I want to hear what you're saying. Your initiative is not threatening. That is, you're saying to them, it, you want to come up with ideas? That's, that's okay with me. I would much rather have, you know, if I was working with this group right now, I would, find, I would want to find the people who had initiative, who, who, you know, I think we could do this, you know, who are coming up with ideas. And it's always easier to rein in a horse, right, than it is to beat them and get them moving. You know, you know how that is? Some people you got, you got to beat them to do anything. You know, it's, you, you know did you do that? No. Uh, you got to call them the next, did you do it? No, I still didn't do it. No, I, I, no, I didn't, you know, you know I, I beat them. Did it. Forget that. I don't want the person I have to beat. I want the person that I'm going, uh, you know, they're doing stuff, and I'm going, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not sure we wanted to do that just yet. Hang on here. You know, hold on. And I'm reining them in, see? Power under control. That's what I'm after, you know? And, uh, and so I look for that kind of thing. I'm not afraid of their initiative. It's not threatening to me. And uh, I put down here, see yourself as trusting your future into their hands. And every real le leader realizes this, that that anything that is accomplished through their life is really not going to be accomplished by them. It's going to be accomplished by the people that follow them and the people that are part of their team. And so they, 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 they see themselves uh, in this way as, as they see themselves as trusting your future, meaning as the leader, I'm trusting my future into the hands of these people. And how I will be judged and how I will be measured, it isn't me. It's what they're going to accomplish and what they're going to do. And then next it says here, invest in them. Share your success secrets. You know, share the things that you've learned. Share the things that you have. And envision a special future for them. That's a very powerful thing. It's one of the most powerful things you can do for somebody. And you will find a great power coming out from you to other people if you will take the time to look at the person. Now, remember, you've, you've, you've listened to some of their aspirations and desires, and you, 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 you're finding out a little who they are, where they're going. But if you'll take the time to look at them and say, you know what, I see this in you. I see you being able to lead all kinds of people in this way. I see you having this influence. I see you. See, what you're doing is you're, in, you're picturing a special future for them. And uh, you will find that people will want to be with you. They'll, they'll feel strengthened and built up. And especially if you have credibility in their eyes, uh, they'll be really excited that you see good things in them. Okay, number three, to lead leaders, you must define the vision and then collaborate. So your job is to define the vision, but then you work with your team to get it done. You know, vision is the dream of the future God wants. We already talked about that, the way things ought to be. So you define the vision. This is what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, what's the vision? The vision is that we would have a Bible study on campus. That's the vision. Now, how we're going to get there, that's a collaboration. That's something we all work on together. So I get my team together, and I say, okay, here's the vision. We're going to have a Bible study on campus. How could we, how could we do that? What could we do? Well, we're going to need to get, get a room. Okay, uh, how do we go about getting a room? Da, 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 da. Okay, Billy, would you go to, you know, the so-and-so assistant principal and talk to him? We want to have a room for a, for a club. And, and uh, okay, so then we have to decide what we're going to do, what's going to happen in, in, in this thing. And, uh, and, and somebody says, well, you know, I hate this kind of Bible study, blah, 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 blah. Oh, really? Okay. Well, what kind of Bible study do you think is good? I'd like to see us do something like, you know, this kind of thing. You know, okay, okay, well, we can do that, right? Because, see, for you, as long as the Bible study gets established, you don't have to control all the different things that, ha that have to happen to make that happen. You, you can collaborate with other people 
as long as the goal, the ultimate vision is actually happening. The methods, in your notes it says here, let the methods be flexible as long as the outcomes are consistent with the vision. Um, there's, a, uh, there's another line here. It says, see yourself as the spark in the engine, not the steering wheel of the car. See, the spark in the engine is what sparks and causes the gas to explode and causes the engine to run. That's what you are. You're a spark in the engine. You're not the steering wheel. You don't have to control everything. You don't have to be, you know, i got to control every single thing that's going on. You don't have to control everything. You're getting your team together, and, and uh, you're keeping the vision clear, and, and then you're letting them collaborate and work, and then, bam, you're, you're going after the thing that you're doing. And then, uh, last of all, I put down here, think team. Think team. We're doing this as a team. It's not just you doing something. We're doing it as a team in that way. I remember a, a friend of mine in high school was a, was a, a, a leader, uh, you know, leader in the school. This was not, when I say a friend of mine in high school, they weren't in high school with me. They were a person that I observed that was in high school. And they had great leadership gifts, great administrative gifts, but um, they, they, they wanted to control everything. Instead of defining the vision, they, were, they had to constantly be involved in every detail, and they wouldn't trust things to other people. They didn't empower other people. And, uh, and they, they were the... The, the, uh, they were the president of their school their freshman year and their sophomore year, and they would, they would have been the president of their class. They w you would have been, the, but, but in the, that third year, all at once, the, the, the class decided to vote somebody else in. This person had worked hard. They had been dedicated. They had been committed and everything else. Why did, they, why did they want somebody else? They wanted somebody else because the, the leader had never learned how to not be a doer. They constantly wanted to control and do and do, and they had never learned the importance of empowering other people to accomplish the purpose. And uh, and so that person experienced disappointment, and the people kind of, uh, uh, you know, rejecting them uh, in that leadership role because they had never learned how to do this, how to influence people to accomplish a purpose. Okay, any thoughts or questions here? You must have something in your high school or something going on or something in your youth group or something that you're thinking to yourself. If you had my youth group, you wouldn't be saying these things because they are losers. What's the, you know, what's the, you know, what's the dream? What's the, what's happening? But you wonder, how can we make this happen? How could that, how could that go on? Yeah, go ahead. What if you don't know anybody else who's a Christian in your school? Uh, I'm going to leave that to tomorrow night because it'll tell the story of what happened in my school and how that happened. Because that was exactly what happened in my school. I got saved, and I went to school, and I didn't know anybody else who was a Christian. And, uh, and uh, one girl on a bus, I was on a bus, and I got talking with this girl, and this one girl got saved, and that was the beginning of the whole turnaround of everything that took place when I shared Christ with this one girl. And uh, I'll tell you the story of what happened finally. Somebody else? Yeah. Oh. Oh, they whispered, I'm a Christian too? To, to uh, like to talking to each other a little bit and connecting in some kind of way and things like that. Yeah, that's a great that, that that's a great idea of of stirring things up by by uh, finding out um, uh, by doing something that maybe helps the people to galvanize and figure out you know oh wow there are other Christians here you know? but somebody ultimately has to be willing to step up you know leadership always has a price tag to it and the price tag to leadership is. Uh, basically the willingness to be rejected right it doesn't mean that you will end up being rejected but sometimes it starts out with some rejection uh, when I first uh, 
in my high school when I first uh, got saved, and then I started sharing with other people. You know, this was before this girl got saved that I was talking about. You know, people were not really open and responsive. I can remember I'd be in class sometimes, and, uh, uh, you know, the teacher would ask a question, and I'd raise my hand, and then this, this little group of guys over here, they'd go, oh, here we go, sermonette, you know what I mean? You know, for my response, you know, kind of making fun of me. And, and then uh, I actually got uh, on the dark side of some stuff, and I had some guy beat me, you know, want to fight with me and beat me up, and, and, and a few people, you know, fighting with me and, and different kinds of things like that. And so it was like at first it was like, whoa, you know. But, I, but see, until somebody steps up, until somebody is willing to pay the price a little bit, if you're always wanting to be, make everybody happy and you know, everybody's pleased with me and everybody, you know, you can never do it. But, but you step up a little bit in some kind of way, standing for what you know is right, you experience some of the wind of rejection and some of the things that happen, but then you also begin to start to experience, which I'll tell you about tomorrow, you also begin to experience some of the miracles of God being on your side and helping you and enabling you. By the time I left high school, I was very influential, but there was a period of time in there where, you know, uh, it, was, it was total rejection because of my stand for Christ. Anybody else? Any? Some question about what you're doing? What, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if, if, if that's the case, one of... Right. If that's the case, one of two things is happening. First of all, one thing that could be happening is you're not a leader, basically. By that I mean you don't have the ability. Because remember, the key of the leader is to influence others. You've got to, if you can't share the vision, if you can't get them you know, there, you're, you know, you're just there. Or the second thing is you don't know the skills yet of how to communicate that vision, basically. And one of the ways, one of the things you have to do is you have to think about your vision that the Lord has put inside of you and then think about the people that you're trying to recruit and say, how does this relate to them? What's the connection for them, right? And, uh, and so, you know, you might find somebody who's an artist, let's say, and that's their passion, it's art and all that kind of stuff. And your thing is you're trying to put together a Bible study. And so you sit down with them and say, hey, look, I'm trying to put together this Bible study. And I need somebody to design posters for me. Right, so now, so now I'm tapping into their energy, right? Instead of just saying, "Hey, look, I'm trying to do this," you know, and and not really thinking through what the connection is to their life and to their situation. Somebody else? Okay, you guys got to loosen up. Tomorrow, tomorrow night, we'll I'll be together again. I'm not gonna. I, I won't even hire, I have notes on it because I'm, I'm just going to tell you my story. And then I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray with you tomorrow night just for the empowering of the Holy Spirit and just for the Lord to move, uh, you know, in, in your life. Because, because God, you, you, you know, you really underestimate what God can do with one life that's given to him 100%. If you put, if you, if you put it all on the line, I'll tell you the story of what happened for me. But if you put it all on the line, if you give yourself 100%, if you, do, you underestimate the amazing things that the Lord can do. And you don't have to be smart. I told you, I, I failed most of my, I failed first, fourth grade. I, I probably failed more grade school than anybody in this room right now. I failed first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. I failed ninth grade. They fa I, I failed ninth grade, but they let me come, you know, several of those years, they let me come back again because of summer school and stuff. But, but uh, no, nobody has been more messed up than I've been, been messed up in that kind of way. But you know something? None of your past is a definition of your future. I, I'm an author now. I'm president of a Bible school. Who would have believed it? A guy who failed five grades, that now he's president of a Bible school. You know, it's like crazy. And uh, president of a college now. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, you, you look at yourself, you know, especially at this season of your life. You look at yourself and you greatly underestimate what you're capable and what the potential is of your life. You greatly underestimate it. 
and, uh, and we're hoping this, this few days that you're with us is that we're going to be able to turn the light on a little bit for you and help you see what God can do with one life that's totally yielded to him. It's amazing what can happen in all of your weaknesses, all your screw-ups and everything else. God can still do something great. Okay, 